Hi, NAR Troopers. Today we're going to talk about a tough subject, kind of, and the subject has to do with um, freedom, and it has to do with murder. Freedom and murder. <laughs> Let me start off by saying all of the events that have happened recently um, in the Capitol and the stuff, this is January 2021, have been absolutely the most shocking, uh, this is my cat Sophie, <laughs> have been the most shocking and disappointing episode in American history, I think because it speaks so much about how deeply fractured our country is and about how systemic problems um, with our uh, with politics and with uh, race relations and with just everything all of our systems educational system healthcare system um, you know uh, our economic systems all of it seems to be in such um, chaos right now and disarray and there's such divisiveness and polarization of everybody. I just want to say, uh, it sounds like um, a relationship with a person with narcissism, sociopathy, or psychopathy. It's just turmoil. It's just cognitive dissonance. It's crazy. It's um, people acting irrationally. Um, it's just so much. So during this time where everything is just... Um, uh, out of control, it seems like. Uh, I think we have to ask ourselves, you know, where do we want to stand um, in this? And what do we want to fight for? What do we want to advocate for? What do we want to um, say, these are non-negotiables that I believe in. This is my value system, my ethics. I believe in equality, integrity, honesty, honor, like choose your virtues that you want to try to defend and then do it. Pick your pick your poison because there's just so many different things that need your attention, whether it's the climate change and um, you know, the the dying oceans and the melting ice caps and all of that, or maybe it's um, you know, inequality uh, in in our school system uh, or in our um, uh, race relationships, you know, with different flavors of people having a problem or whatever it is that you see that is problematic, it's time to do something. And one of those things, one, and this is a segue, that was the lead in, this is the main thing. One of the things that we have so much trouble with, and you wouldn't be here today if you didn't have trouble with it. One of the things that we have so much trouble in, with is this relationship or the relationship that just ended rather with the narcissist, sociopath, or psychopath. We find ourselves after in the aftermath of either escaping or being discarded. We find ourselves being damaged and traumatized in ways that most people do not understand. They don't understand why this is not just a regular breakup. Why this is not just a, well, just get over it. You know, it's been X amount of weeks or months or whatever, you should be over this by now. And that is not how it works. You know, you're doing everything you can just to stay alive and fight for your very survival. This has been a soul rape. You have been extinguished. You've been murdered. They murdered you metaphorically, sometimes literally, but we won't go into that. If you're listening to this, you must not be one of those literal cases, but they murdered you metaphorically. They betrayed you. They stabbed you multiple times. They threw you by the side of the road and left you for dead. And then they disappeared and, and just evaporated into thin air while pushing a reset button and essentially erasing your existence, all of the memories, your entire history, all of the maybe years, in my case, almost two decades of marriage. It's just like it never happened. And the parts that they do uh, have some memory of is so convoluted and distorted. They have twisted it. They have turned it. They have uh, 
they have distorted it to such a degree to make themselves, to absolve themselves of any kind of responsibility or any kind of culpability. They have to bend the truth and reinvent the truth. It's revisionist history. That's what it's called. It's revisionist history when they take the truth and they have and they turn it, they twist it, and they reinvent it into being something that never happened. It never happened that way. Or part of it did, but a lot of it didn't, and they've taken like a little shred of the truth, and then they've just done this whole thing to it to blame shift and project and to do all these things to make you the bad guy. Because let me tell you what, if you've been tangled up with a narcissist, sociopath, or psychopath, I guarantee you they will never accept accountability for what they did. They're never going to accept blame. They're never going to admit any wrongdoing whatsoever. Every single bit of it becomes your fault. All of it. And they can do this and say, it wasn't me. I was the victim. I was the victim. And when they are the persecutor, they are the predator, they are the heartless, soulless, conscienceless, that's hard to say, um, thing that was able to treat you in such a cruel and brutal and savage way. Oh my gosh, the way that they brutalize you, right? Um, and so you stay, you know, the trauma brain, the the um, Stockholm Syndrome, the trauma bonding, the intermittent reinforcement. I hope you're familiar with all of these terms. That's why you stay. You stay because you're addicted to that roller coaster ride of abuse and reward. There's abuse, but you know it will pass and there will be some wonderful makeup period where it will return to the golden ages where everything is like, you know, puppies and flowers and sunshine and rainbows and it's going to be so yummy and so delicious and so just ah oh, it's going to meet every expectation dream and wish that you ever had because you know how they do that they're shapeshifters they're faking it they're mirroring you they don't really care about you they don't really have any feelings towards you you could lie dying hemorrhaging bleeding out right there in front of them and they'll step right over your freaking body and keep going. They don't care, but they act like they do and they study you and they, they listen to you and they're smart and they're manipulative and they figure out what does this person want? And then they become that. What does this person need? What is their secret desire? And then they provide that. So yeah, they're a dream come true because they are a dream and the dream it's a nightmare. It's a freaking nightmare. So what do we do? What do we do when we're trying to recover and free ourselves from a brain that is chemically dysregulated? Yeah, the chemicals in your brain are all jacked up because of this relationship. And this can go on for years, not just in a couple of months that follow the, the dissolution of the relationship, but it can go on for years that you can be uh, having a chemical imbalance in your brain. The neural pathways have been changed. They have done studies and research to prove that after a relationship with this kind of abuse that affects your mind, it's just this big clusterfuck of mess. After that has happened, they have shown that it actually alters the cellular structure in your body. And so it changes your DNA in a sense, I guess that's probably a stretch to say it like that or maybe misleading, but you get the idea is the same that this actually happens. Um, so what do you do when you have all that going on? Trauma is stored in your body, like muscle memory, and you've got all that messing with you and holding you back. You've got your addiction to the abuse, the addiction to the illusion, the addiction to this person that doesn't really exist. So what do you do to get free of that when it just owns you and you have the looping thoughts, you have rumination, you can't get them out of your head, you find yourself doing the most humiliating, degrading things you never ever thought you would stoop so low and grovel and beg and, and just crazy stuff because you just can't get away. You can't walk away. You just want to hang on to them, you know, and hope that they come back and hoover. Do you know how many times I see messages on 
these online forums like on Quora and Facebook and stuff where they're like, will I be hoovered? Does every narcissist hoover? Because I really want to be hoovered, which means they're going to come back and abuse you again. Why would you want that? But, but you know what? We all do sometimes. <laughs> I'm guilty of it too. It's like, yes, please come hoover me. Come back and abuse me some more for another 16 or 17 years of my life. Let me give you all the years I have left. I'm not young. I'll just give you the rest of my years. If you'll just come back and abuse me some more. And then there'll be good parts in between the abuse. And I'll just live for that. That's so pitiful. That's so sad and pathetic that we would settle for that. Really? Really? We want to be hoovered. We want these people. We know what they are now. We understand it. We've done the research. We've studied about it. We know about what they're incapable of feeling. We know what they're capable of doing. So I have a solution. It's a partial solution. And I got this solution from, um, from a person who, um, you know, there's so many people who write about this. They have podcasts, they have healing recovery programs that you can buy. Um, they have video series, they have just, you know, all kinds of things. And, you know, I have favorites. Uh, I like Sam Bilkin. Uh, I listen to a lot of Sam Bilkin, Melanie Tanya Evans with her Thriver TV. I love her. Um, Dr. Romani, um, the, you know, I could just keep going. There's a lot of different people I really enjoy. Uh, Lisa Romano, people like that. There's a lot of people that are out there trying to help people because most of them uh, have been through it. In the case with Sam Vilknen, um, I think that he is um, a narcissist. So there's work out there for narcissists and sociopaths and psychopaths. People want to pick your brain. People want to understand how this all works. You can start a business and, and get a pretty good following. So, um, so this one I got from um, H.G. Tudor. He's a narcissist and he has a podcast. He writes articles. Uh, on WordPress that he that you can get in your email box. He sells logic bulletins where you pay like 10 or 20 or $30 or something and then you get this subject matter that he's written about. Um, he's written numerous books um, and he's uh, been interviewed several times and I've heard that. So um, he has a very deep understanding of what he is because he's a greater narcissist. There's like lesser the middle kind and then the greater narcissist or the top category. And the way that he explains it is, is very brilliant. Well, I got this idea from him. He said, the key to freedom from, from this, and I'm always listening to stuff, not just to get ideas of what, what people are talking about, but mostly to help myself because I'm still a work in progress and it has been 18 and a half months. 18 and a half months since my discard and I am... Um, always looking for uh, material that I can use that's going to help me with my recovery. So I was listening to him and he said the way to freedom is you have to say they do not exist anymore. They don't exist. They just don't exist. So he said that and I started thinking about that. So you know when you know that you're a narcissist or a psychopath or a sociopath narcopath, as I call them, when you know that your narcopath um, has, has discarded you and just reinvented themselves in a brand new life with lightning speed, like the next day they shape shift into something else. I watched my husband shape shift for about 10 months, 11 months, maybe 10 or 11 months just being totally ungrounded, disconnected, out of his freaking mind, talking about how he was gonna, how he was an ascended master and how he was gonna, how he was talking to aliens in the desert, and just crazy stuff. And then he found somebody to attach to and to shape shift into her, attach to her and start mirroring her, attach to her and start getting her character traits and stealing her personality traits 
to the degree that he has now sort of like sort of like an alien kind of like blended with that he's like mirroring it so much that has become his new identity she has provided a new identity for him so now he seems a lot more stable because he's her uh he is her right now he is she or whatever you know what i'm trying to say so i thought about that idea and i thought yes yes that makes complete sense they can't exist because if you're thinking of them existing, then you're going to be thinking, oh, I want to be hoovered. Maybe he's going to come hoover me. Uh, or you're thinking, I'm just going to have to go get revenge. And I'm going to have to do something to this person to be able to sleep well and live with myself. There must be justice. And you're conniving. What am I going to do to him? They're going to occupy space. They're going to occupy space in your brain if you do not kill them. <laughs> and I am not, please don't take this out of contest. I am not suggesting actually, literally killing them, murdering them, but you do have to murder them metaphorically to be free. And when I say that, that means that you have to murder them and in your mind, you have to treat it as if they are dead. And you can have a little ritual pretend ceremony where they're murdered and you have a little funeral. And I did that. I had a little funeral for my husband. And I thought, and I said, okay, June 18th, uh, 2019, June 18th, 2019, suddenly out of nowhere, he's gone. He, he just, after all those years of marriage, and faking it and mirroring me and attaching to me and becoming me for his identity, suddenly he just disconnected, like pulling a plug and poof, he was gone. Just like that, just boom, gone in 60 seconds. So that was the date of the death. And I did a, did a, like a ceremony for that and said, okay, you know, um, rest in peace, you know, rest in peace. And, um, and then after the ceremony, every time I start to think about him, I'm thinking like, he's, my husband is dead. I'm a widow, or widow, I'm a widow. And my husband died on June 18th, 2019. And so what am I, th I, I don't have to worry about being hoovered. I don't have to think about revenge. I don't have to, you know, stalk him on social media. I don't have to be tempted to go no contact because he is dead. He's dead. He's dead, dead, dead. I, I didn't just make it so that he just died. You know, maybe I did murder him or, or pretend like I murdered him or killed him. Or maybe it was just, um, he got struck by a meteor. Have some fun with that on the different ways that you can imagine that they meet their death. Maybe they're using so many drugs and having sex with so many different partners in their drug-fueled, orgiastic, hedonistic, um, open relationship kind of things that they do, like he's doing and like a lot of them do. And you could pretend that he just suddenly uh, explodes, you know, or melts. He, you know, he's so hot, he just melts like lava and he dies. And that's how he goes, you know, in, in a bed filled with drugs and lots of orgy people, you know, and, and he just melts. He gets so hot, he just melts and drips onto the floor. And then that's the end of him. I'm a writer. I have a very vivid imagination. <laughs> Please forgive me. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so you can have fun with that. Try to imagine how they met their end and then have the funeral. And then if you start to think about them, say, what am I doing? He's dead. He's gone. He no longer exists. He no longer exists. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, there's just this kind of freedom because you know you can't give them space in your head. You can't entertain that. You can't allow that to happen. You're chasing a demon. You're chasing a vampire. You're chasing a phantom that doesn't exist. And that's crazy. Right? Didn't Einstein say or somebody say, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different outcomes? Yeah, I've been crazy for years. 
years and years and years, 15, 16 years we were married. I was crazy the whole time thinking, you know, he's going to be all right. He's just having a bumpy spot. He's just doing crazy things. He's just betraying me and lying to me and being a weirdo because he's a weirdo, but he'll overcome it. He's just quirky. He's just um, whatever. But in reality, he's not going to overcome it. That's that's what he is. It's that's yeah. What little identity he has is is that person that has to go out and get fuel. The person who has to betray and abuse and exploit and be an opportunist and to suck the life right out of you. That's what they are. That's what they have to be. It's not like they have a choice. I don't think they have a choice. And even if they did, they would choose the bad thing because it's so much more fun, right? Remember that saying, if it feels good, do it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, that'll get you in a lot of trouble. Um, or at least it'll get you some awful icky disease. Anyway, um, what is my message for the day? You have to kill them or find some other way to imagine that they are dead. Come up with some cause of death, have some little funeral, and then in your mind, anytime they pop up, just say, what am I doing? I can't think about a dead person. This is crazy. He's dead or she is dead. I don't want to forget sometimes, you know, these could be females. Um, and so you have to remind yourself of that. Uh, and and, and it's, there's a wonderful freedom that comes with doing that. They did it to you when they left. When they left and when they completely uh, hit that reset button and they completely abandoned you and erased you and annihilated you and expunged that's a great word, expunged any memory of you that was accurate or real or tender or loving or whatever you thought was going on. It wasn't. They've erased it all. You don't exist. They never think about you. You have to do the same to them. You have to do the same to them. It only makes, it just makes a world of sense. There's no, this is not an ex that you can be friends with. This is not an ex that you can um, you know, if, if you have kids with them, find somebody else to be an intermediary and pick them up and drop them off. Communicate through that third person. Do something, but get them, excise them, cut them out like a cancer. Annihilate them and hit that destruct and erase button just like they did to you. And then you go on your merry way and you have your life. You're capable of feelings. You're capable of being something that's not uh, a soul sucking, uh, empty, dead inside kind of uh, shell of a human. You know, they're not even really like human. That's why they get so easily. And I'm going to say this and I've had people disagree with me. I think that's why. It's so easy for them to get possessed with entities and Luciferian influences. And some of you may not be religious. Some of you may not believe in demons or stuff like that. But, you know, <laughs> I want to tell you, it's for me, my experience is very real. Uh, definitely, you know, we talk about, I'm going to, I'm going to have a little side uh, digression here just really quick. Cause I want to, it came to my mind. I have to say it. Um, stream of consciousness. That's what I'm going to call this. Uh, twice I saw the demon inside mine and you're thinking, oh my gosh, she's so full of it. That's just crazy. No, really. The black sparkling eyes that looked all wet and inhuman, like that's not human. And the smirk and the total, total expression that took over his whole body and the energy, the feeling of it was pure evil to the point I knew he would kill me with his bare hands, rip out my entrails and feed them to the dogs if he could figure out how to do it and get away with it. Yeah. Murderous, evil, and it wasn't him. There was something else looking at me that came out from inside him. I saw it twice. Twice in all those years. Um... I know it's real 
and I know <laughs> here's some, and you know why? Because I have look it up. The dark um, demon, black eyes of the narcissist. Google that. There are millions of cases of people reporting that they saw that. What is that? Some group hallucination? I don't think so. I know what I saw. It wasn't him. It was something evil. And it got into me, used him as a conduit. And do not be mistaken that these things will sneak into you and occupy you too. Yeah, you should be scared because they do influence you. And that can happen. It can happen. It happened to me. I had to go. It's a whole other story for another day. But I actually had to go to priests and to people who could perform an exorcism. And yeah, that happened. And yes, I wish I had video recordings of that because if you saw it, you would never be the same. Oh my gosh. The, the, the things that happened when that thing came out of me was, um, and, and it came from him. It came from him into me. So you have to kill him. You have to kill him. Not literally. <laughs> no, not literally. You have to kill him metaphorically. You have to pretend that something happens to him that kills him. Or maybe you kill him. Somehow he's dead. And then you have some little ceremony. And then that's it. You're free. And, and you have to really buy into this. The fact that he's dead. Because you know what? It's not that far from the truth. Aren't they already dead if they can't feel any remorse or guilt or empathy or compassion or values or ethics or love or intimacy? Aren't they dead? They have a beating heart and breathing lungs. They have well-functioning genitalia. But what else do they have? They are empty. So they might as well be the walking dead. They are zombies. They are, they're dead. So it's like you're not really killing them. You just need to accept what they are. They're dead. And I think it helps to have a, you know, a pretend thing about how they died. And just so that you can stamp it, stamp it, name it and say, yep, June 18th, 2019, he died. And he's dead. He does not exist. He does not exist. And say that a million times. Stick it on little sticky notes all over your house. He doesn't exist. He died. Give it a date. The date that he discarded you. The date that you left. Give it a date. Remind yourself he's dead. And believe it. Accept it. Know it. Feel it. Believe it. Never doubt it. Never question it. Never look back. They don't. So that's my message for today, Dark Troopers. I'm sitting out here on my patio. It's a screened in porch. It's very nice, very peaceful. Little birds are chirping, even though it is January. I think they're very confused about what season it is. Um, did y'all hear that? Yep, there's a squirrel that comes up and barks at my cat that is over there somewhere. Yeah. Um, we have to embrace this life because the clock is ticking. The world is, has crazy stuff going on. Who knows how long we're going to be here? You only have a certain amount of time. Do you want to spend what time you have left suffering and wrestling with all of this recovery from narcissistic abuse? It's some crazy stuff. It's not your regular breakup. You've got all kinds of stuff going on. I believe that it will help you tremendously if you will just kill them and then remind yourself daily that they are dead. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be happy about it. You don't have to have any feeling about it. Just you're a widow or widower. And your partner, I mean, in my case, I was married to this person for a long time. Year after year after year after year. But maybe you've just been in a relationship with somebody like this. And maybe a couple of years was enough to really do you in. Uh, whatever your situation is, they're dead. And you can figure out the rest. And, and let me know. You know, send me an email. Uh, put it in the chat. Put it in the re comments below. Try this out for um, a month. For like four weeks. 
Let me know how you feel at the end. I'm very curious. I would like to know how you feel. You can visit me at my website at NARC Troopers. Like every day I say, hey, NARC Troopers, we are troopers, we are soldiers, we are warriors. Because <laughs> we're not gonna give up on life. We're not gonna give up on the feelings that make us alive. And that poor person that we were tangled up with that is so broken with their personality disorders and whatever, they are not alive. They're dead. Let them go and remind yourself they're dead. They don't exist. They don't exist anymore. They're just, they're dead. And I want to know how that makes you feel after doing that every day for like a month, for like four weeks. It takes a while to establish a habit. See how that feels. See if you feel more free, more in control of your emotional thinking. And if it helps you make progress when, on your healing so that you can continue with your life and enjoy these beautiful sunny days where you actually hear the birds chirp and the squirrels bark and you have hope for a future with maybe a partner who understands love and intimacy and they're not just actors, shapeshifters, weird, creepy creatures that aren't, aren't okay. Yeah, you deserve better. You deserve the real thing, right? I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to a time where I'm I meet somebody who is not mentally impaired and they're capable of loving me the way that I know how to love someone because I'm real and I'm alive. And my narcissist, sociopath, ex-addict, he died many, many, many years ago when he was very little. And I killed him again recently in my mind and I'm a widow. I even tell people that. I go to groups online, virtual groups. I've even been to a bereavement group and I said, you know, I lost my husband June 18th, 2019. It's not your conventional kind of uh, situation. I, I don't feel comfortable going into the details, but just know that um, he is uh, dead to me. And for all practical purposes, he is dead, just in general, he's dead, he's, he's dead. And I'm a widow-er, widow-er, I'm a widow. <laughs> Whatever that is, I never have gotten that straight. Okay, so that's it for today. I wanna let you go, it's already gone a minute or two over. So um, yeah, I, I love talking to you guys. I hope you're staying safe in this time of the pandemic. You know, it, the pandemic is, is real. Wearing a mask helps. Keeping socially distanced helps. Stay away from crowds, that helps. If you don't have to be in a group setting, don't go. If you can figure out a way to, to not be in the workplace or at school or at groups of people, then don't do it. Stay safe. This isn't gonna last forever, but we need to be patient. It could go on for a while. This is a historical life-changing thing, you know, for our world and for us, life is never gonna go back and be what it was. The past is gone. There is no returning to what's normal. It wasn't that great anyway, the world or your relationship with your narcissist. It is time now to rise up and claim something better, make something better, grow something better, create something that that is not broken like our world has been and like your relationship, your person that you loved was broken and they couldn't love you back. They're dead now and I'm sorry for that. It is a loss. Grieve it and move on. Don't look back at the world as we knew it when there were all these restaurants and movie theaters and, and giant music concerts. Don't look back at that. Don't look for it. Don't think that we're gonna go back to normal. There's no normal to go back to. Some of that's gone. A lot of it's gone. You have to adapt because things are changing. The world is changing and you are changing and you have a chance to save yourself and create a better, stronger, healthier you. And that's where all of your attention should be now. Creating a better, stronger, healthier you 
and forget that person. He's dead. He's dead. He's gone. He's not coming back because he's dead. And all you need to do now is focus on you. Because you can't bring back the dead and you can't bring back the past. And right now we're all learning lessons on how to let go and how to do better. So that's it for today. I'm happy to have spent this time with you if you made it to the end. Thank you for this wonderful gift of time. I hope you're healthy. I hope you find happiness and that you're staying safe. Okay, much love. Bye.